Hi all, Alicia Tubbs here with The Sudden Homesteader and today I would like to make a point that goes along with the video that I recently uploaded on the topic of studying prophecy on your own and this point I felt is so important that it actually needs its own video. Uh, the point I made in my last video and if you want to go look at my last video the link is below. A lot of this will make more sense probably if you watch that. Uh, but the point that I made is that churches are not teaching prophecy or they're teaching it improperly. But we as believers are still responsible to learn prophecy. We are still responsible to educate ourselves. God has given us the resources we need. And one of the big mistakes that I'm seeing in churches that actually do teach prophecy is that they're failing to connect God's word to current events. I'm not advocating for newspaper exegesis, but it's really hard to look at the news and read headlines and not make the connections to God's word. God told us what would happen as the time drew near for Christ to return. He gave us many signs to watch for, and he instructed us to be watchful. And it's very evident that those signs are falling into place that these signs are actually happening, coming to pass, and all the pieces, the stage is being set for everything that he said was going to happen. You would almost have to deny the truths in God's word to not make the connections between what is happening today in our world and what God said would, would happen. When I talk about prophecy, to be clear, I am not talking about you know, adding events to the Bible. We would never do that because the book of Revelation tells us not to add to or subtract from God's word. So whatever God has said is going to happen about the end times, he's already said. I'm not saying we should add to that at all. What I am saying is that we need to see the connections between the events that he has already laid out for us and what's happening today. When churches or Bible teachers treat prophecy as if it's all or almost entirely historical, or that it's allegorical, or that the events are symbolic of the spiritual condition of man's heart, or anything like that, what they're missing is the point that I would like to make here, and that is that God is a good father. A good father prepares his children for major life events. A good father prepares his children for great challenges. He warns his children, he gives them instruction, he imparts his wisdom to them. I'll give you the example of a family that's about to relocate. A good father would prepare his children for this move. He would tell them where they're going. He would tell them what to pack. He would tell them when to pack by. He may not have the exact move date for them, like he may not know exactly when their house is going to sell and they're going to be able to move into the new house, but he would tell them things like, by the time you graduate from middle school, we would like to be moved in, or by the time summer ends, you should have your whole room packed, right? Gives them little warnings, little signs to look for to be ready. A bad father would do just the opposite. Bad father would say something like, I'm relocating and you can come with me if you want, I'm leaving, but you better get in the car without giving you any warning, without letting you pack, without letting you prepare, say goodbye to your friends, uh, perhaps learn a new language if you're moving to a different country. A bad father doesn't prepare his children. A bad father, when it comes time for his kids to drive, just throws the keys at them and says, Oh, go ahead, knock yourself out. A good father gives instruction, and if he can't give it himself, he'll at least pay a teacher to give his children instruction. And the Bible tells us that God is not a bad father. The Bible tells us that God is a good father. Psalm 145, 9 says, The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. Psalm 34, verse 8 says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Psalm 107 verse 1 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. And I can go on. There's many examples as well as statements that prove that the Lord is good. So humanity is headed for a very big event. The signs are all indicating that we are approaching the end of our current age of history. 
that would be the end of the church age, the end of the age of grace, the end of the Gentile age. Some people would call this the apocalypse or the end of the world or the end of the world as we currently know it. Biblically, it's a transition from one age to the next. So we're transitioning from the Gentile age inside of which the church age is hidden and that will also come to an end. But what's going to happen in the future is that the world is going to transition from being run by Gentiles and Gentile kings and kingdoms to being run by Jesus. This is called the Millennium Kingdom, also known as the Messianic Age, because at this age in history, Israel will be the head of the nations, and the nations will not rule over Israel. This is a huge event on the horizon. God wants us to be prepared for this transition. He is a good father. He wants us to know the signs. He's given us plenty of signs, and he wants us to look up when these signs begin to happen. This is very apparent in passages like Luke 21. When these signs begin, we know that Jesus' return is soon. Now, sometimes God doesn't equip us for things right away. Like he will give us a task, like the Great Commission. He says to go teach, baptize, preach the gospel to all nations. And as we go and follow his command, he equips us and teaches us along the way. And the reason why he does not equip us or prepare us ahead of time necessarily for the task of evangelism, although I would argue that he does give us life experiences that do prepare us ahead of time. But the point I'm making is that he asks us to just go and evangelize in faith. And the reason is for that is that in addition to bringing salvation and news of Jesus Christ to the world, he is also growing our faith. When we follow him in faith, he wants to grow our faith. The end of the age is very different from his command to go and evangelize. The end of the age is not a faith-building task. It is a major historical shift between ages. The end of this age, as the Bible tells us, is going to be bananas. It's going to be hell on earth. Basically, we can come to faith now and be a part of the church and get raptured off the face of the earth before the tribulation, or we can experience a preview of hell on earth through the tribulation. And this taste of hell on earth is really going to make everyone just see how helpless we are as humans and how much we need God and how Jesus really is the only salvation that we can't save ourselves. People everywhere are going to suffer excruciating pain. And this will just be a taste of hell. So as to hopefully get people thinking about how they don't want to spend eternity suffering apart from God, but how they would rather be with Jesus in paradise, eternal paradise. The end of this age is, is going to be so horrifying it is a last chance that God is giving for humans to turn to him. And the Bible describes this time right before Christ returns as a time of great distress. Matthew 24 verses 21 through 22 tell us, For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Things are going to get so bad that if Jesus doesn't come and return and save humanity, humans would be extinct. Isaiah 13, 11 through 13 tell us, and this is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah, I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will halt the arrogance of the proud. And I will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a mortal more rare than fine gold, a man more than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore, I will shake the heavens, and the earth will move out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. Okay, God is actually going to shake the earth out of its place, like shake the earth off its axis, it sounds like. 
the, the judgment here that God is pouring out on the earth is going to be so severe that mortals, humans, will be more rare than fine gold. That's how whittled down the population is going to be. So the end of our age before the return of Christ is a catastrophic time in history. And if we're going to say that all Bible prophecies have been fulfilled, that revelation is over, that it has nothing to tell us about the future, and that all the other books of the Bible, everything that they say about the future and the second coming is symbolic or allegorical, then what we're saying is that God has left us no information about this catastrophic ending of our age, and that he expects us to face this great distress without any knowledge or comfort or understanding. That would make God a bad father, but we know that he is a good father. And he has included so many prophecies to show us what the end of the age is going to be like. And he gave us a way out. I'll explain more on that in just a minute. Now, it's true that God doesn't reveal everything to humans, right? We know the canon is finite, although we could spend eternity studying it. But God only reveals what we need to know. For instance, the exact timing of the ending of this age. That is something that only the Father knows but he does tell us to look up, to stay alert, to recognize the signs. We should have a sense that Jesus is growing near. And I don't know about anyone else, but I have a burning in my body when I think of Jesus' nearness. It is just unspeakable. I can't even articulate what I feel. And I know this is the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know if Jesus is going to return in my lifetime, my kid's lifetime, you know, someone else's lifetime, but I know that in this burning, I know he is near. And perhaps he's given me that burning to spur me on to evangelize and to make videos like this, to help others, to see how near we are, to help others to find Jesus before they have to go through the tribulation. And even if you go through the tribulation, God promises a huge harvest, there's going to be so many people who cling to Jesus and who reject the Antichrist and reject the mark of the beast and reject the false prophet during that time. But if you can avoid that great distress and you can come to Jesus now, then I urge you to do that. And I will explain how to do that in a moment. I want to wrap up the point of this video by saying that the end of the age is something that the father, the good father, felt that we needed to know about. And that's why there is so much information in the Bible about the end of this age. God is good. Okay, now the moment you've all been waiting for. How do you escape this tribulation, this great distress before the end of the age? How do you make it to heaven? How do you not go to hell for eternity? The answer is very simple. Jesus. You need to belong to Jesus. If you belong to Jesus, he will come for you because you are his bride and he will take you to himself to be with him forever right before the tribulation. Although some people say there could be a gap between when Jesus takes his bride, the church, and when the tribulation begins. Many people criticize a pre-tribulational position as being as preaching Christian escapism. Christians, we do not escape any suffering in this life. If you are out there evangelizing and doing it right, doing it according to God's model, leading in faith and not trying to lead with worldly models, you will be persecuted. You will suffer. Blessed are you when you are reviled for my name's sake. If you are doing evangelism and you are walking in righteousness, you will be persecuted. You will suffer for Jesus. You're not going to escape that ever. And also, you're not going to escape life's troubles. We all suffer. We all get sick. We all get hurt. We all lose loved ones. No one escapes the curse of sin and death in this life. But the Bible does promise that we are not appointed to this time of wrath, that we are not appointed to this great distress if we are in Jesus, if we belong to him. And we are certainly not appointed to spend eternity in hell if we are in Jesus. So how does one belong to Jesus? It's very simple. You need to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Here is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus, who is the Son of God, came down from heaven, was born as a baby, born into a human body. He lived perfectly, blameless, never sinned once. He died on the cross for our sins. Because he was blameless, he was the only pleasing sacrifice to God. God needed a perfect, blameless Passover lamb to pay the wages of our sin. And when Jesus died, he was this perfect Passover lamb. He took the sin of the entire world, all of our sins upon himself, and our sins were crucified with Christ. He was buried, laid in a tomb, and three days later, God raised him from the dead into a resurrected, immortal body. He is the firstborn from the dead, the first fruits of the resurrection. Because Jesus died and took our sin, Anyone who believes in him believes that he is the only perfect sacrifice, that he is the only way to God. It is only by believing in Jesus that you become a child of God. It is only by believing in Jesus that you get to God or get to heaven. It is only by Jesus that you receive eternal life. When you believe that, your sins are taken away. When God looks at you, He sees the righteousness of Christ. He sees a perfect and clean soul. He sees you as sinless. Now, of course, we still mess up and sin, but Jesus paid for all of our sin, past, present, and future. And no, we should not go on sinning because we should be so grateful for what Jesus did that we want to live righteously, that we want to follow in his ways. Okay, the second thing that happens when we believe this good news about Jesus is that the Holy Spirit comes to us and seals us for the day of resurrection. And the Holy Spirit also teaches us and guides us as we follow Jesus. But that seal for the day of resurrection is so important because that seal guarantees that whether you die before the rapture or whether you're alive during the rapture, that Jesus will take you to himself. You are so precious to God that he will not even leave your body here on the earth in a grave or your ashes or your remains. He won't even leave your remains here for this time of great distress. He's going to take all of you, body and soul, and you're going to get a new body just like Christ lives in an immortal body you will receive an immortal body. So all you have to do is believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. He died for your sins on the cross, and God raised him to life. And that is it. You just believe, receive the Holy Spirit, and you are sealed for the day of resurrection. Now, if you miss the resurrection, please don't miss the resurrection. Please. My heart breaks when I think about what's going to come upon the earth and what people are going to suffer. I just can't, I just can't fathom the degree of suffering. And there's a way out. God wishes that none would perish, right? He made the way so simple. It's just belief, believe in Jesus. But if you do miss this day, if you miss the rapture, God in his grace still makes salvation available to you. At that point, you would have to believe in Jesus, right? If you miss the rapture, and, you know, the rapture happens and your Christian family gets raptured and you're left behind and you're wondering what's happened. Well, at that moment, you can put two and two together and you'll, you might come to believe. I pray you come to believe at that moment, right? You just witnessed your family disappear. At that time, you, you need to put your faith in Jesus and just wait for his return. And you will most definitely suffer greatly. And many people will die during the tribulation. If you die during this period and you have not pledged loyalty to the Antichrist, you have not bowed to him in any way, you have not taken the mark of the beast, which would enable you to buy and sell, right? You've just, you've rejected that mark because you reject the Antichrist, you reject the false prophet, you reject the whole Antichrist system, and you wait for Jesus. You might die, but during the tribulation, death will be a mercy for most people, but you still have entrance to the kingdom available to you. Even beyond just entrance into the millennial kingdom, We have the promise of eternal life. 
with God in Christ. If you pledge loyalty to Christ, you believe with all of your heart that he's the son of God, that he's your savior, you will be with him forever, forever, for all eternity. And you do not have to go to hell. If you fail to believe in Christ, if you take the mark of the beast during the tribulation, if you reject Christ and you accept the Antichrist as your Messiah, you will suffer eternally in the lake of fire. This is just what the Bible tells us. Okay, it's not a joke. Hell is real and it's excruciating and it's eternal. Nobody has to go there. Jesus paid the way with his own blood. He died for you. No other God has died for you. He died for you. And he died for you while you were still a sinner bent against God. Okay, it's one thing to say to someone you love, I'll die for you. I will give my life to save your life. But Jesus died for us while we were still enemies with him. We were just in rebellion against God. Our sin was so great. And he died for us in that moment. People had mocked him, beaten him, spit on him. His closest friends had betrayed him. He died for all of those people in all of their rebellion. And that's how much he loves us. And God loves us so much that he sent Jesus to us. The father did not have to send his son. The father could have kept his son comfortable in heaven and we could have all perished because we all have sin. Okay, sin is a condition that entered the human race when Adam and Eve took the fruit. When Adam and Eve believed the lies of Satan over the truth of God, we were all bound for hell. And God would have been perfectly just in letting us all go to the lake of fire along with the demons who the lake of fire was created for in the first place. But he didn't. The father loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us. And in addition to that, we are also sealed by the Holy Spirit. So we are loved by the father, the son, the Holy Spirit, the whole trinity, the three in one. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit and we are set for the day of resurrection. And you can be set for the resurrection and for eternal life right now. You can do it right now at your computer, wherever, if you're on your phone, wherever you are, you can just believe right now and receive all the benefit and blessings of being a child of God in Christ, sealed by the Holy Spirit. I love you all so much.